Brian Dalton, welcome to Mormon Stories Podcast. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Oh yeah, it's a pleasure. We're here at the uh, 2010 August Sunstone Symposium in Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, Brian's about to go on stage and perform in front of a live audience. Yep. Is this your first Mormon audience you've ever uh, performed in front of? Well, no, because back in the day, um, I, did a, uh, I did a Mormon album with my partner, Paul Steenhook, and which we recorded for Embryo, Embryo Records, if you remember that, Lex back with Lex Diazavedo. Yeah, and so we, we toured the whole western United States with our, uh, with our music and our message. Rock and so roll? It was kind of, what would, what would you call it? It's, it was more <sighs> Barry Manilow meets Lionel Richie meets other Mike Post. All right, sing us, sing us your favorite song from the album. Oh, I'm, you know, you're never going to get me to <laughs> sing those again. <laughs> Well, once again, thanks for, uh, thanks for coming on the show. Sure. Um, so uh, in typical Mormon stories fashion, let's start with a little bit about your story. All right. Um, I grew up Mormon. My, uh, my mom was a true believer. My dad was less so. Um, he joined the church basically to keep peace in the family. Um, was, was in it pretty much, you know, did the whole primary and scouts. and. Where were you? Uh, living in, in Long Beach, California, or right near there. Um, and uh, about 12, my, my parents, they were, they were very old when I was born, in their, in their mid-late 40s. Um, they kind of just said, yeah, go, go off, do whatever you want now. <laughs> You're 12, uh, whatever. So I kind of stopped going to church, and then I, and then I, I came back because I had a, a really good uh, teachers, is it teachers? Teacher's Wait, quorum advisor? Deacons, Deacons teachers, teachers, priest, yeah. priest, priest quorum advisor, who called one day, I thought this was really cool, I was 16, and he said, um, hey, you know what, uh, you're technically part of my, my charge now, can you just come in once Sunday so I can meet you, see who you are, uh, if you never want to come again, that's fine, but I want to know who you are, and just say hi and all that, I was like, that there's a, there's a deal. I never have to go again. This is great. The guy was so dynamic and just amazing. Just one of these great, unbelievable speakers and teachers and funny and smart and all that stuff. And I thought, this is, this guy's kind of cool. So I started, I started going again. And then I had my big, you know, conversion over when I was about 17. What um, happened? Uh, I was kind of, I was kind of wandering, um, you know, I was really into rock and roll when I was younger, and I was very good at the guitar. I played very well early, so I was in, to, in with like older players. I was playing with 18, 19, 20, 26 year olds. When I was 14, I was playing on the, on the strip in, in Hollywood. Um, the sex, sex was not in the picture yet, but the drugs and rock and roll were very high on the priority list, and was doing a lot of that, and, and uh, just kind of, found out that it wasn't, I didn't want to live like, like that. So at about 15, I kind of, I kind of checked out of that scene and just started kind of figuring out who I was, what I wanted, studied a lot of Eastern religion. And um, I had been uh, dating this girl for a while and we split up that summer. And I, during it all, even though I wasn't gung-ho on Mormonism, I'd given her a Book of Mormon because that's just what you do. Yeah, it's, it's, it's in the genes. So... I gave it to her, and over the summer, she, she started kind of looking at it, and then she, uh, she called me and said, hey, you know, I, I've been reading this Book of Mormon. I'm kind of interested in it. You know, what, 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 what should I do from here? And I, I basically, I thought she was trying to get back together with me. I didn't want to have anything to do with it. But then, like, a day later, she called me, and she said, you know, the Mormon missionary stopped by my door yesterday, and I saw that as miraculous. That was a sign to me. So I, she started taking the lessons, I kind of took them with her and started learning more about my religion again from that. And just had a big, you know, the whole big spiritual experience, testimony thing. So you and, got a confirmation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, was, I was in it about as deeply as you can get. And then, like all things I do, I do everything like 400%. So I studied like crazy. Um, I, would, I would actually get up before seminary. <laughs> to study and then go to <laughs> seminary and then come home and then just read, 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 read. I was, I devoured everything. That's what I just, I, that's just me. And, um, I, I got very serious about it. And uh, like I said, I did the album. We did an album of music, uh, together 
And I ended up, uh, I ended up working with um, a Jewish theologian who does a, a national, nationally syndicated radio show. He, didn't, he wasn't doing that at the time, Dennis Prager. Hmm. Um, and learned a lot more about Judaism, met a much bigger, broad kind of cross-section of religious people because he used to do a show, this great show called Religion on the Line where it was a priest, rabbi, rabbi and minister every uh, Sunday night. Great show. And um, um, he taught me a lot about critical thinking. And, um, and he had encouraged me to write this book on God. And my, my kind of, my, some of it that started my way out was I realized I didn't really know both sides of that story. Um, I, knew, I knew the pro, but I didn't know the con. And I went and checked out a book and freaked out and tried to talk to him about it, but he didn't really know what he was talking about either. And it was, it was very depressing. And uh, I kind of had to t come to terms with all of that. The, the, I ended up um, just, just becoming a, a skeptic. No much. mission, no mission experience. I started to go. I went. I was. I was going to go to Hasifi, Brazil, and I was in the missionary training center for about six weeks when we got the word that Lex de Azevedo wanted to do an album with us, and I had to kind of choose. What do I want to do? What do I want to do? What do I want? And I loved music. I'd been doing it my whole life, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to go do that. Um, that well, was an interesting. How was that? That was an interesting experience because you don't go <laughs> and then come back. It's just not something anybody does. I got ostracized in a big way, hugely, um, from even some of my closest friends were like, your you know, ward, your ward community. Yeah, my, my ward community and pretty much the whole stake um, until the album came out. And then I was <laughs> the hero of the day. And, you know, everyone started telling me, oh, this will touch far more people than if you'd gone to, you know, yeah, Hasifi, Don, Brazil. Don didn't go, right? Yeah, there you go. So, um, how many copies did it sell? Do you know? I, you know what? I don't really Thousands? know. But it was just when uh, Mormon Radio was starting up. I don't know if it's still going in here, but we were we did we did well. We were selling well. We were we were touring all over, and then and uh, you know the problem is you can't tour at a church and then sell the the album. So you have to hope that people are going to go. And at that time, it was there was no internet, so you were going to the 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 uh, the. Uh, the bookstore, Desert, like, Book? Desert Bookstore, or uh, there was another little place. Times selling? and Seasons is what it was called. Were they selling your album? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell us the name of the album again. It was called Speak to Me. Okay. Bri Brian and Paul was the, uh, the our group name, and uh, but we had a good time. You know, it was great. Uh, it's it's you know like the, the height of Mormon rock stardom. It's hard to <laughs> take aside from Donnie and Marie. We weren't in their league, but it's got to be hard to take advantage of the groupies when you're a Mormon rock star. Yeah, you can't. You can't do it. Yeah, I, I never got a chance to, yeah, it was a bummer. No benefits. Dang. Yeah, it started without benefits. That's exactly what it is. It sucked. So. Um, Sorry, I didn't mean to sidetrack. No, that's okay. The, 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 I, you know, it's, it was kind of one of those gradual things where I just kind of moved out of it. Um, I realized that I really didn't have the talent to be a Mormon. I was, uh, my, I think it, a lot of it had to do with my dad's skepticism and he was, he's just, you know, he just didn't buy anything, um, and needed kind of proof for everything. And I, I think it, I think I, I was deep in my heart an empiricist long before I realized that I was. And so the empirical case for Mormonism started to break down for me, but also I didn't like what the church was doing back in the nineties. And, um, in particular, when they, when the September 6th thing hit, that was, that was pretty much it for me. That was my Galileo experience where I said, okay, you know what, this, this is just crazy. So I tenured my letter of resignation, as I like to call it, and uh, ran it over to my, my bishop. And, and I think he knew what it was because I had it in an envelope and I fully expected that he would open it up there right in front of me, but he didn't. <laughs> he just kind of, you know, and honest to God, I thought when I, I sent it in, I thought there would be some swarm of people coming to try to bring me back into the fold. There was n not one where they wanted to get rid of me as much as I wanted out of there, I think, because I had started to kind of question and, you know, and I had to stop going to church at one point because I realized, you know, they're not here to ask questions. They're here to to drink the, I don't want to say the Kool-Aid. That, that it's was a my ritual. First I've heard yeah. it described as a ritual. Yeah, it very much is a ritual just to, to build the faith, build the faith, build the faith, not question and get, get answers and or that learn. kind of stuff. Yeah. So um, now, had you dug into polyandry and peepstones and 
you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was a big, uh, just before I left, I was a huge Michael Quinn fan. Um, loved Sunstone, loved Dialogue. Um, read it religiously, no pun intended. And, um, you know, I, was, I, I knew my Mormonism backwards and forwards. I, 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 I knew it really well. And, I, you know, I knew that the archaeological case was, was faltering, and I knew that the DNA were, was becoming problematic, and, yeah, and stuff like that. So that's why I said empirically it was, it was, a, it was a, you know, it was a slow kind of movement out of it. You know, when I read B.H. Roberts' um, Studies of the Book of Mormon, that kind of really makes you go, okay, they've, we've known this, this, a lot of this stuff for a really long time. And, you know, that kind of makes you feel like, oh, boy, everyone's just, just hiding something from you. It, it, it didn't feel right. So the, the excommunications were pretty much it for me. Because, you know, Michael Quinn, if you're, if you're a historian, you just show the guy where he's wrong. <laughs> That's all you have to do. You don't have to excommunicate. So that was, that was pretty nefarious in, in my book. And I just said, I'm out of here. One of my interesting, the interesting things here is the, the, la, the, the first Sunstone Symposium I went to was the year I left. And I was very worried about how I was going to be received by people if I told them what I'd done and everything like that. And it was, it was the neatest thing where uh, if you would t you know, tell somebody, they would say, are you, are you Mormon? And I would say, well, I used to be. I just, I just uh, left the church uh, this year. Oh, I would get this every time. Oh, I, that is so courageous. I wish I could do that. I'm like, wow, okay. I, I, I'm here with my people. I can, I can get into that. I can live with that. So, um, I think it was a time where a lot of people were very unhappy with so this the church. Is 93. This is 93. Yeah, this is right in the, right in the heart of it. Yeah, and a lot of people were, you know, and I get it. There's a lot of it's. There's a lot of cultural baggage with it, and uh, you know, just other things that 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 keep people, you know, striving to to do something with it. I I didn't feel the need to do something with it. I I just said I'm done. How did you reconcile the spiritual experience that you had had? Um, when, I think when I was really, really honest with myself, my reconciliation was that I got what I wanted. Um, that that the, the human mind is, is uh, plasticky enough to, to create your own experiences. Because I had some pretty big ones, you know, that at the time I thought, man, this is, this is big stuff. Um, uh, but some of the stuff that I thought that I knew either didn't come true, um, like in my own personal spiritual revelations that I was getting about, uh, well, one in particular about a girlfriend that I'd been with for a long time, that just, I was just dead wrong on that. And then when you do find out things like the, the empirical case, that it's just not what you thought it was, and you've had such a great testimony about this thing that you... I'm 99.9 .9 certain that the Book of Mormon events didn't happen. Okay, that to me is an empirically testable claim, which I think we have enough data on. When you know that you can do that to yourself, you start to, okay, I can't trust my own, my own instincts, my own feelings about these things. I, and that's, in essence, as I put it to a friend of mine, I don't trust my heart. Oops, sorry, I'm touching the mic. I don't trust my heart because my heart is a solitary thing. I can't, I can't bring my heart, I can't expose my heart to you in the most true way and, and have that another heart speak out against maybe what it feels is not right in my heart. But I can do that with my brain. I can do that with my brain. My brain allows me to connect with other people in a way that I think ultimately is more reliable. That's basically what it came down to me. Do I trust my heart? Do I tr trust my head? And if I can't get those two in sync, I'm going with my head every time. And that's, that's where it came out. Now, maybe that's a, just a very intellectual view, um, but it's served me well so far. In the last 17 years, I've, I've, I've done well following that path because my, my heart is just full of blackness and horror and, <laughs> and, and, and evil. So I don't trust my heart. I go with my head. My head's pretty good. <laughs> so did you catch grief by family or friends? Um, you know what's ironic is that my dad was probably the most upset. He was more upset than my mother. And I think part of it was that he, he was like, hey, you can't do that. <laughs> if, if you can do that, I could have done that 25 years ago. I don't know. But he was very upset with it. And he, he, he was, he was angry with me and really came at me. And my mom was 
pretty cool about it. She had kind of a peace about her with it. I think she was unhappy that she, she knew she was going to die and, and that because uh, she died in, oh God, almost 10, yeah, about 10 years ago. So 2000. Yeah, after a long bout with Parkinson's. And, um, you know, she, she'd always heard, you know, if you raise your kids in the church, you know, they, they might wander and whatnot, but they'll come back and that kind of thing. And she even said that to me one time. I said, I'm not coming back, Mom. Sorry. I, I don't want to break your heart, but, you know, it's not going to happen. I, I'm, I'm dead certain of that. Um, but uh, there, there was something probably disturbing in that about her, but I didn't want to, you know, leave any false illusions with her in terms of where I was at. And I wasn't anywhere near where I am today in terms of my views of everything that I was then. So... Um, it probably would have been worse for her had she lived on. But my dad, my dad, on the other hand, the the one of the worst things that happened to him is when my mom got sick. My dad was the guy in the ward who, any time, day or night, you could call on this guy. He was Johnny on the spot. And when my mom got sick, no one in the church was there for him. And it really, it really took its toll on him because you know he was 82 years old carrying around this 80 year old. Uh, you know, woman to the bathroom and, you know, and making all the meals and really got no support. And it, it kind of, it kind of set him to thinking, he's now on, on my team on, on pretty much he's still everything. Alive. Yeah. He's 92. He's crazy as ever, but he's, uh, the missionaries still come over, the, the bishops still come over and, and take it. And, and he, uh, he, you know, loves to give him a hard time. He just got done reading the God delusion and, uh, the end of faith and, uh, he can't take the Dennett book, but I, I, the other one that he had was, um, what's the other big one? Uh, Dennett Harris Hitchens. Oh, God, it's not great. So, um, and he likes, to, he likes to tweak the missionaries and the bishop when they come by. He's, he's a little bit more of a sicko than I am, because I, I I, I'm not confrontational on a personal level like that. I don't, I don't, I don't need to get into it with people. But your dad anything. does. My dad loves stuff like that, yeah. Tell us real briefly about your professional career. Just um, what what have what have been the main things you've done? Well, it's it's kind of all over the place because I like I said I started in music, and I did that for a while. Guitar, you're a guitar player. Guitar and keyboards. Okay. Yeah, I kind of shifted. I, I early on I was I played a lot of guitar, and you know I studied classical guitar, and um, I was very good, very young at that. And then I got turned on to keyboards by I was in a group with a guy who said, you know, can you maybe play some keyboard? Parts. He was a. The guy ended up being Roland uh, Music's big thing, and now he has his own company where he creates some of the best sound stuff that you can buy. Um, he, he turned me on to keyboards, and I started seeing that I could do a lot of stuff on my own. And particularly, I didn't have to rely on a drummer. That was my, that was the, always the hardest thing in music to get a reliable drummer who wasn't just the biggest. I don't even want to talk about it. It was always hard to find a good drummer. So the drum machines were starting to come in and, hey, you know, I can do a lot of this stuff on my own. And the synth sounded like strings or horns or you could you could pretty much program and do whatever you wanted. Um, now we look back and it, it sounds like it sounds awful. But um, and the tools are so much better today. But it, it really did help me out. I, I did a lot of that. And then um, I got fed up with the music business because those people are just awful. <laughs> I don't know how, other, how else to say it. In every, I've been in quite a number of industries now. No, nobody tops the, the music industry as just the most evil, awful people on the planet. Um, so I got out and I thought, what am I going to do? I sold all my equipment and I ended up buying an Apple laser writer and a, and a Mac and doing, uh, it started out as typesetting, laser typesetting at the time. And then I bought a guy's company and, and then I turned it into a graphic design company and I that's what I've done for 21 years until... Um, graphic design. Graphic design. For websites and... Well, I, it was pre-website. I was there when, when desktop publishing was really was desktop publishing. Okay. It was a pain in the tuchus. And uh, it kind of slowly transitioned over, you know, I'm one of the Photoshop One users, you know what I mean? Or actually beta users, if it goes back to that far. And um, I did a lot of work for the... KBC, um, they were KBC, Disney, Cap Cities, they kept changing hands. Um, 
the radio stations in LA, uh, Radio Disney, KBC, like K- KLOS, everything, anything that needed to be done okay. graphically. Yeah, I would I would do that. And then a lot of the stuff in Clear Channel on Clear Channel San Diego. Um, those were my big clients. And uh, in two thousand three. Or two thousand no two thousand one. A friend of mine and I had been talking about making movies for a long time because I used to make a lot of eight millimeter movies with my friends and edit them in the old fashioned way and stuff when when we were younger. The Adventures of Dog Man is one of my proudest. And um, are these on YouTube? No, I don't know where you oh, could find on, these. I have uh, my friend has them from back in the day, and I don't know where the heck they are or or what. But they're it's time to give they're, me a call. I used to have this really long hair, and if you put this nice dog Halloween mask over me, I turned into the to Dog Man. Um, it was our little uh, spoof on on superhero movies, but. Um, in two thousand one, we my friend said, you know what. This digital stuff that, that they're starting to do now is getting kind of cool. We should we should make a movie, and he bought a camera, and so I bought a camera, and he said, "Now write something and let's make a movie." And I did this uh, little film called "Killing the Dream," which was about two idiots who wanted to make movies. So it was it wasn't too far from from our life story. Just everybody was dumber than we were, and uh, which is saying a lot, by the way, because we're pretty we're pretty down there. And it did well. It won a festival, and I got a director's award, and it kind of circled the country on the film festival circle, played in Europe. That's a text. I'm not going to get it. I'm, I'm paying attention to you. Um, that's how much I love you. So we did, we did well with that, and then we, we, we actually got a distribution deal, and everyone at IFP, the Independent Film Project, was really behind the film. They helped take it to market and get it sold and everything. And when the distribution deal came in, they said, you know what? Don't take this deal. Remake this movie. Because if you do this, this, and this, and Miramax liked it, and Focus Features, and I talked with a guy from Focus Features who said, you know, if you did this, this, and this, reshot it in high def, and blah, 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 tweak the first stack, you know, I think you could, you'd could, you really have something. So we actually started going out trying to get money to do that. And we couldn't find any money because we didn't have any names attached to it. And that's what it's basically come down to now. So... I had written Mr. Deity, and um, a f- like three episodes. Jimbo loved it. We tried to cast it with the people who were in my movie. I thought these guys would be good as Mr. Deity and Larry. Nobody wanted to have anything to do with it for the longest time. It sat there for probably two, over two years. And then Jimbo and I were on a video shoot. I had been doing video production since then, and. He said one day, he said, you know what? Why don't we just shoot the darn thing? You play Mr. Deity, I'll play Larry. Let's see how it goes. You know what? What can, what can it harm? I said, okay. We had to shoot the first episode three times because I was so bad as an actor trying to... Because there's a, there really is an art to directing and acting at the same time. It's, it's, a, it's so incredibly mentally consuming. You have to be paying attention to so much stuff in so many dif- different areas all at one time because we don't have a big crew when we're, do- when we're doing the show either. You know, I'm doing sound, I'm doing lighting, I'm doing pretty much everything on the show and then I'm standing in front of the camera. So it's difficult and it took me a while just to get on top of that. One of my favorite stories is I, we shot the second episode with Sean where Sean plays Jesus and I'm coming in and I'm telling him, you know, here's the deal, here's the downside. Um, and I would be in the middle of the take, and I would think, okay, I have, a, I have a piece of direction for him here to make this better, but I didn't want to break the take, because you don't want to mess with an actor's rhythm, and Sean's an old, he's, he's been doing it for years. And then I'd say, okay, well, I'll tell him at the end of the, th- the thing. And of course, what would I do? I'd forget what the direction was at the end of the thing, till we're in the next <laughs> thing, and then you remember, oh, yeah, that's what it was. And so... It took a little while, but we put we put the first three up on YouTube, and I guess it got a mention from somebody on Dig or, or Reddit or something like that, and um, the views started to skyrocket, and then YouTube put it on the front page, and then they went up even more, and the next thing we know, we had people, companies like Mosaic um, and Sony calling us to do it, and so it, it was just, you know, it's just this kind of meteoric rise to now our mediocre <laughs> existence so so what um it's an interesting artistic sort of there's some interesting artistic choices in mr deity it's kind of campy yeah it's kind of yeah. fun yeah 
It doesn't feel mean. Talk about some of your artistic decisions. Yeah, I th you know what? A lot of people have asked about that, and I think it's just the fact that I'm generally not a mean guy. I don't, I don't really have an ax to grind about this, uh, this stuff. I do want people to think about certain things and certain aspects of, of these things that they believe, that they've been brought up with, that they've been kind of indoctrinated since childhood that we don't really think about in a very concrete way. And so that's what the whole thing is about. It's about concretizing ideas that you believe, or at least you think you believe, but have you really thought this through to this next level? My, the, the, the favorite example of mine is Mr. Duty and the Evil, the first episode where we, we understand that he's a good, he's an all good, all powerful, all, uh, all knowing being. So you've got that, that classic, you know, trinity. Um, and so then you, the, the classic question of evil is, well, if he's all good and all those things, why do we have evil? And okay, well, at a certain point, what you realize in the creation of the universe Decisions, decisions had to be made about what evils were going to be allowed and what weren't because we're not capable of every evil that, that's imaginable. I can't wish you harm and you, you know, like right now you lose a leg. That's not possible. So there are certain freedoms, you know, in terms of free will that we're not allowed. The episode we, uh, the example we use in that episode is just that, that I can't, I can't wish you harm. But there's all, there's all kinds of things, you know, we don't, we don't, f fall into an endless void just magically. And once again, I'm not answering that text. That's probably my wife going, where the heck are you? Um, so it's all about that, at what you realize. And really, the idea of the Mormon God, who is a corporeal being and who exists in time, plays so perfectly to those things because you, you have a being who really did have to make a decision. OK, well, we, let's leave in holocausts. Let's leave in uh, torture, you know, men, women, children, babies. Yeah, babies. Um, and then you start to go, hmm, that just, there's something a little janky about that. I'm not sure that I get that or, OK, I get that that's a problem now, but I'm, I'm going to have faith anyway. OK, I respect that. But um, at least realize there, there are problems you know, with those things. And, and the issues like free will, we have an episode coming up this season because it's the prequel season where they're doing, they're doing a lot of the deciding about what's going to go down. And we have a whole issue about free will, which is one of my biggest pet peeves in religion because everybody uses it to get him off the hook and it doesn't get him off the hook. There's no getting God off the hook if he's ultimately responsible for everything, which is, which is the idea. Unless Although it's a small in Mormon, G, unless it's a small G God. Unless it's a small G God, which is very Mormon and which I kind of like in, in that regard. Um, and we, and we play with that. We do kind of play with that a lot. And clearly in this prequel season, you're going to see a lot more of the fact, like we've already mentioned, when he comes out of the void, you're not the God. There may not, may not be a the God. Uh, you're just a God. And uh, I don't want to give away what's going to happen in the season, but a lot of this is going to be, a lot of it's coming from my, my Mormon background and all of that stuff. We're not quite doing the war including in heaven. Including his name. Yeah, inclu including his name. But all we're right. not we're not quite going to the war in heaven and the and the segregation of, uh, one you know, the one third, one third, one third thing. But um, it's it's going to be it's going to be fun. So, um, are you trying to deconvert people? Um, Do I don't know that I'm trying to deconvert people. I don't I don't really care what people believe, but I do want people to understand that things that we believe actually have consequences. Um, if you believe, for instance, that what you do doesn't count here, which I think this is the most pernicious idea ever in the history of mankind, which is basically your, your Protestant, your generic Protestant Christianity, that our, our works and our actions have no bearing on what happens in this next because world. Because we're saved. And... Because you're saved. Yeah, you've, you've, you've said you're, you know, accept, accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, and that's done. It's done. If you believe that, it's very easy to then, you know, people are logical. Whatever you want to say about them, they are logical and they, they are rational. The question is, are they starting from a premise that, that works or not? Because if you start from that premise, you very easily move into, well, you know what? If, if what I believe is the most important thing, and this guy over here is saying something that is heresy, and he's going to cause my son to end up in a world of eternal doom forever, then I might have good 
cause to maybe put him on the rack or put him in a strapado or put him on the stake and burn him alive because he's threatening something far greater than, I mean, there are really logical consequences to all of this stuff. The guys who flew the planes into the buildings were thinking logically based on the, the, the ideas that they were working from. Um, so those things, what I want everyone to understand is that that kind of stuff has consequences in this world. And I, my, my biggest thing, my, my mission now is to get people to understand that these books that people think are holy, that contain the will of God, um, if people follow them seriously, the world will be a much worse place. And that we need to start using um, the tools that really have made the last 400 years the best 400 years on this planet for people in the West. And that is critical thinking, rational skills, freedom, democracy, um, all of the tools that we have um, laid out in both our, our Constitution, the, the Bill of Rights, and um, just post-enlightenment thinking. That's, I, I want people to really get that it, it's, it's not a comparison anymore. We know when people follow this stuff and take it seriously that it leads to hell on earth. So we've got to start rethinking this. You can still have the spiritual component. Um, I would still consider myself a, a quote unquote, I don't like using the term spiritual person, but to the extent that I find awe and wonder in this universe that is so beyond me, um, I still have that. I didn't lose any of that. In fact, in many ways, I, I think I gained more of that than I lost. Real quick, what about people who'd argue that science and, and reason, unbridled by some type of religious moral framework, can lead to atrocities like Hitler's regime? Well, I think it, I think it can. I think, I think the biggest problem is, is not, I, I wouldn't say it's religion per se. I think the biggest problem is ideology of any kind. Ideology and dogma. When people, surrender themselves and their brains and their ability to think and fall in with, um, you know, Eric Fromm did a great book called Escape from Freedom, which was a study of, of Nazism and how people surrender their sense of identity to the greater group. When people do that, every single time in history, you get trouble. And to me, the, the scientific, so things like the scientific method, which say we're never certain about anything. We've got to keep pressing forward. We might find another way to do this. Let's not, let's not rule anything out. This is our best guess right now, but let's not cement our best guess into being something that we have to hold on to. That, to me, is what religion is. Religion is we had this great guess. 4,000 years ago, someone took a really good guess. I think the world came about in six days, and I think that thing over there is a source of light, too. We have the big one over here, and we have the small source of light. It's so and, nice. Yeah, and I think there was no death before the 6,000 years, okay? And, uh, you know, we took a guess. They took a good stab at it. And it's creative. It's very creative, and it's beautiful, and, it, and the mythology is great. But you cannot hold on to that and say, no, this is, this is what it is, despite the evidence. You have to keep moving forward and saying, we have to be humble about what we think we know. And I, I find that more. Now, I know, I know there are some very unhumble, is that a word? I'm humble, I'm hum uh, humble. I gotta, yeah, lack, they lack humility within the scientific community. I get that. And, um, but, I think the basic tools and the, and the self-correcting kind of way, because this, one of the great things I love about science is if you think, if you've got a theory X and it's come to be accepted, and you can come along and knock down theory X, you're going to be a god, at least for the next 200 years or however long that thing. It really is based on the people who, who say, you know what, we were wrong about this, get the applause. That doesn't happen anywhere else. It really doesn't, where... where you topple another paradigm. I mean, that's, it's an impressive little thing to see. There was a great story about the guy who first thought that he'd found the first extra solar planet, extra um, solar system planet. And what he, he was going somewhere, I can't remember where it was, to present his data on this big paper. And it's, in going through it, he rechecked the stuff and he realized his data was wrong, wrong numbers. So he's there. It's a giant gathering. He's the main star because he's going to announce this thing. And he goes up there and says, you know what? I messed up. I messed up. I got the wrong data. Everyone stood up and applauded the guy. 
I mean, that's that's the beauty of of kind of the self correction that I that I love. So so science and reason should have humility. Yeah. But that begs the question: What do we? You know, I hear often: What do we base? What do we base our morality on if it's not a religious standard? It's just it's just anything goes. It's all relativistic. Yeah. You know, the problem with that is is nobody lives by it. Nobody lives by these religious standards of morality. They they all. When you ask a really religious person today, really, so how did you decide that, that, that murdering homosexuals was no longer something you found morally acceptable? Well, uh, what it basically comes down to is they have, the same, they have the same methods for getting to their morality on that as I do. And there, there, there is no, the, the problem is, is that these questions of morality, I think, have been thought of completely wrong. Th these the way we talk about right and wrong and all of that kind of stuff have this old world thing to it, but it's basically nothing more in, than what we prefer and what we want and what we think is good. And we're, it's another chance for us to do the best that we can do at the time. We have to keep, this is what we think is best now, but let's not, let's not hold on to it like it's, like it's God's word coming down to us because we might be wrong. Genocide which was ordered by God in the Old Testament, not a good thing. We've come to that now, but we didn't come to it by God telling us. God told us just the opposite, if you believe the books. The same with, with uh, you know, homosexuality and uh, adulterers and Sabbath breakers. They're all supposed to be dead. We're supposed to be killing them left and right. Nobody does that anymore. But they don't do it because God said, no, let's not do that, do that anymore. They, so you're, you're saying that religious people base their... God's morality on their own preferences. They just do like the an same. Atheist. They do the same thing that we do. We try, we all try our best to say what is good, what is right, and we have ideas and principles by which we follow that. I love the golden rule. One of the things I love about the golden rule is it's a pretty empirical standard. If you say yes, I think this is right, and then and someone says to you, okay, then we can do that to you. Well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I probably wouldn't want to have that do it. You can't, you can't fake that. You can't say, you know what, I think torture would be okay if I thought the guy was a heretic. Okay, well, we think you're a heretic. Can we torture you? Mm. There's a very empirical element to the golden rule that I, that I love, and it's, it's powerful. But we have history now. You know, we can look back. Um, that you, you couldn't do that 3,500 uh, years ago and look back and say, you know what, when people do X, it does not lead to the good that we think it's going to do. When you wipe out an entire people who we think are bad at the time, it doesn't end up creating a better world. It just doesn't, so let's rule that one out. Okay, there's gotta be a better way to do it. And it, it's, another, it's another time where I think if we use the methods of science and critical thinking and the scientific method of, of theorizing, uh, Jared Diamond has this great idea in his latest book of doing natural experiments, which are pretty much, they've been done for us already in history. We can look back and look at the history and say what works, what doesn't. We have a much better base to, to judge that stuff on, particularly in terms of morality. We know that, that looking at another people and saying, you're, you're evil is going to lead to some terrible, terrible stuff. And you certainly can't do it for 2,000 years. You can't call a people the people of the devil and then be surprised when six million of them burn. It just doesn't happen. What, what, um, back to this question of humility, I've heard some, even scientists or atheists, say that Dawkins and Hitchens aren't great spokesmen because they're so, I don't know, some would say angry or they're so confrontational that they kind of give atheism a bad name. Yeah. Um, I think, I think to, certain, to a certain extent that's true. It's not my tact, and I don't know if it's my good Mormon upbringing um, or whatnot, but I have to, I have to be honest to you. I, first of all, I've met Richard Dawkins. I've spent a good amount of time with him. He's one of the sweetest men I have ever met in my life. I love him. He's just a really good guy. He's angry, I think, because to him, and to me to a large extent, the world is upside down and nobody sees it. And, you know, he gets, he gets, people are angry that he's saying these things about religion, organized religion, and he's coming very down on them and, and accusing them of great evils and, and, and whatnot. But, you know, the, the thing that I would hope that religious people would remember is all he's doing is talking, okay? When, the, when we did the opposite 400 years ago and Christians had power, 
We burned at the stake. Uh, um, Giordano Bruno, um, Galileo got locked up for 400 years or for, for the rest of his life for saying, you know what, that we might be going around that thing. Um, there's a there's a lack of perspective to me in how people like Hitchens and Dawkins are tolerated that is historically ignorant. That's the only way that I can say it. Because um, religion has no place to. Religion has no place to say, oh, you know, you're offending me. Well, 400 <laughs> years ago, offending me was you got you on a stake. It got you burned or put away. I mean, people don't, I think people just don't know. I've been doing a recent study just for deity background of the Inquisition. People have no idea what went on for 800 years. The fear that people lived in, they literally created the first terrorist state in the most honest way where people were scared to death of whether their neighbor was going to say, you know what, I think Bob next door might be a witch because he's going up on the rack and he's going to have to give names. And if he doesn't, he's going to, you know, they're going to cut him in the gut. If they do, they might burn him, you know, give him a nicer death. That was the sweetness of, of that plan. Um, but the other thing is, um, I, ha I have to admit, if I had the eloquence, particularly of a Christopher Hitchens, <laughs> I wouldn't be able to control myself. <laughs> He's so brilliantly and devastatingly witty, witty in terms of his, his attacks. I, I couldn't do it either. L luckily, I don't have that kind of wit, and I, I have to go with humor. That's, that's the only difference between them and me. But I, I, I very much sympathize with him. I, I, in, in my personal kind of view of things, I really like S S Sam Harris, the way he, he has a, a very measured reason. Not taking it. Not taking it, and I'm staying with you. Um, approach to the things, and I like Daniel Dennett a lot too. I thought his his book uh, Breaking the Spell is is probably one of the most insightful books I think I've ever read in terms of religion, and um, you know he has a, he has a very different approach from from Dawkins and Hitchin, but you know I get Daw Dawkins' point, and and the other thing about these all the four the the four horsemen that I think people have to understand is I do think they see and they saw on 9/11 it's a whole new ball game, it's a whole new world. You cannot tolerate this kind of level of rationality, and then say, you know we're going to be okay because if people like that do get nuclear weapons and want to bring jihad to the world. It's going to be the end of us, and somebody has to start making that move in the in another direction because we don't have a leg to stand on. We really don't. We can't say to those people, "Well, you're silly for having these beliefs and whatnot." I mean, the, one of the things that cracks me up is everyone's so upset about this draw Muhammad day. You know, people are getting death threats for drawing Muhammad, the the guys on South Park and whatnot. And oh, that's crazy. That's just because of their stupid Quran and what it says and blah, 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 blah. And yet here we are denying equal protection to homosexuals because of a book. There's really no other reason. What it says in a book, that's it. There's no other rational reason to deny equal protection, the 14th Amendment, to homosexuals and their right to marry, in my, in my view, other than the fact that we have this book that says homosexuality is, a, is, a, is an abomination. So it, to me, it's the same thing on a different level. I mean, Christians aren't flying planes into buildings, but they've done some pretty awful stuff themselves. So I think whenever you think you know the will of God and you're pretty darn certain of it, you're going to get us into trouble. So <clears throat> let's take it personal for a second. I can see someone reading Hitchens or Dawkins or watching your show and thinking, oh, maybe, maybe there's not a God. That can be terrifying. It was for me. So, I. Yeah. So let's say I'm, I'm a believer, but I'm flirting with atheism. Let me ask you some questions, and you make your best case to assuage my concern if I'm oriented in that direction. Okay. So uh, number one, uh, that's scary. Like, my world will fell apart. What about the afterlife? It is horrifying. I spent probably two years doing what I learned later was called the, the ego death by a Buddhist friend of mine, where I, I literally had a, the hardest time sleeping. When I left Mormonism and I left God and religion and the afterlife, it's not just that I'm going to perish. That I can endure that, that I'm going to be ended at some point. But the greater, more horrible thought that everything is going to end. <laughs> there's, no, there's not going to be any Shakespeare. There's not going to be any Louis Armstrong. You know, All of the things that I love are going away forever. That is a tough tough uh, thing to overcome. And I don't, I don't have the world's best answer. Um, one of my answers is, is, is I, I don't believe 
the other side has a really good answer if you start thinking it through, like eternal, we're, we're gonna be, do, on, on the, this new thing that we've started, Way of the Mister, we're gonna start concretizing some of these things that aren't necessarily deity material, but we're going to show, okay, living eternally, what, what you do, okay, the first, first 10,000 years, okay, we've knocked off that, we've done that, we've done that, what do you wanna do now? <laughs> Boy, uh, you know, these are ideas that people think about living forever, for instance, or, you know, living with God and, you know, things, issues of free will. When you think about an afterlife and free will, you know, that's one of the things that we're going to address when you get into this concept of free will. If you go to heaven, do, do you stop having free will? Um, how does that work? Do I not get to choose the you know, if I want to go do this, if I want to go do that, if I don't have my freedom in the afterlife, I don't want to be there. That's not someplace I want. I think all of these things are just things that people talk about. And we want, we, I get that we all want to, we, no one wants to end, you know. But I don't think that's, that's you know, in a, in a way, I think it's just a childish way to think. And I think at some point you have to move beyond that and say, this is, this is the life that I have. I have to do what I have to, to make the best of it. One of the things that I came about, there's the meaning question. What does life mean? What do I, what do I mean? Um, my own personal philosophy is that there is no intrinsic value to my life. And what that motivates me to do is to make my life valuable. And what that means to me is if my life is valuable, if it has value to another sentient being like myself who is capable of assessing value. So all of a sudden now, I'm doing a lot more things for even just my wife, <laughs> who, you know, I wanna be a valuable person to her and to her life, and I wanna be valuable to you, and I wanna be valuable to this guy. My life needs, I need to have value, and the only way for me to do that is to become a person of value to other people. It's a little bit of a Robert Nozick, and, uh, Nozick uh, philosophy, um, but I, it really appeals to me that I have to, because uh, quite frankly, I would rather have my life mean what I want it to mean than to be the guy, and we did an episode on this in the second season, to the, be the guy who's a cautionary tale. You know, we, we, uh, we had the idea in the second <laughs> season that God, they, have, they play a card game for sure. the meaning of people's lives. And you flip over a card, oh, he's going to be a cautionary tale. You know, um, and we all know those people. Their lives, their lives have no value other than the fact that they serve to say, don't do that. <laughs> don't do what Bob did uh, and move on. So... You know, what I would say is, yeah, you, you do lose some of that stuff, but I think what you gain in terms of personal freedom and personal control over your life and what your meaning is and what your value is, um, it's a lot about taking responsibility and not letting people, you know, one of the things that I had to do is figure out what I think rather than, you know, because we grow up and we get all these things thrown on us and we take them on, but they're not our thoughts. And uh, Robert Nozick, again, did say, you know, he said that Socrates said the examined life is not worth living. That's too harsh. But it's certainly not our lives to, to live if we haven't examined our thoughts and know who we are and what we really think. We're living somebody else's life. And so it's, it's a quest for that kind of, of individuality and responsibility and, and saying this is who I am and this is what I really think. And all of this for me basically came down to one simple thing. What can I look myself in the mirror and say, I believe. I believe this. I believe that. I believe the other. And I simply couldn't. And maybe it's just part of my makeup and who I am and the way my neurons fire and the synapses are connected that make me a skeptic and all of these things. But at the end of the day, we all have to look ourselves in the mirror and say, yeah, I believe that or yeah, I don't. And in the end, at the, the other thing about that is that at the end of the day, we all have the same thing controlling why and how we can say that, and that is reason. Everybody has reasons. No matter what you think you believe, there's a reason you believe it. And then the question you have to ask beyond that is, is that reason reasonable? Is it, is it a valuable reason, and is it something I should pay heed to? In my case, what I found out that a lot of the things that I believe just didn't have good reason, and I couldn't, I couldn't back them. And then at the end of the day, I had to look myself in the mirror and say, okay, this is who I am. All right, so if I let go of God, I'm going to become an adulterer and a, a drug abuser. And, uh, a well, record. that's what I did first thing. I went out and just had <laughs> sex with so many women, it was frightening. Um, you know, once again, if, if 
if you can truly say that you think this is the most valuable way to live, that, that for you and for other people, um, you know, I don't have a good argument against it. But again, it's one of those things where I think the golden rule, golden rule works really well. Um, but you're invoking it, a religious principle. Well, it, but that tra it does transcend religion. It came, first of all, it came before organized religion. It goes back, um, I think, f uh, the, the first uh, enunciation of the, the golden rule is in the uh, Hammurabi Codex. Um, but again, it's another great empirical thing. Michael Shermer in his book, um, um, The Science of Good and Evil, he says, you know, th there's a very simple principle here. It's called the, the just ask first principle of anything you're going to do, more morality speaking. For instance, if, uh, if you're in a marriage and you decide, you know what, I, I want to go have sex with uh, the woman in my office, just go ask your wife if she's okay with it. Let's see how it goes. And if she proves, you're good to go. <laughs> um, never going to happen for most people unless you have some kind of open marriage. And, um, and then, you know, one can make empirical arguments even about that. But the, but the problem... But reason would say if your wife doesn't know, then it can't hurt her as long as you don't transmit a disease to her. Well, I th you know, that's a foolish way to live, I think, because first of all, y first of all, you know, and it affects your behavior in terms of how you, affect, how you, have, how you approach her. And if you've, made, if you've made oaths to people and covenants to people, you don't need God to be in back of enforcing that. You, you need some sense of integrity to say, I've said I'm not going to do this to this person, and I'm not going to do that to that person. So either I'm going to do it or I'm going to not do it. And to the extent that you don't keep your word, you are no longer a, a person of value. You are no longer a person who can be trusted. And to the extent that I know that I can't trust you, you and I are never going to have a quality friendship or relationship. I remember, I remember driving out with a guy who I was, I was working on a project with, and and he started telling me that he'd been having this affair with this girl in his office for, for the last couple of years. And I knew his wife and kids, and we were all chums and everything. And he was finally opening up to me. There's one thing that I knew the second he told me that. If this guy treats his wife and kids like this, I'm screwed. I don't have a chance with this guy. Because he's gonna, he, if he'll do this to people that he loves like that, the, uh, the logical conclu conclusion I can draw to him, he's, he's not a person of value. I'm not going to be able to trust him until he gets this idea out of his head that he can just treat people like that. So, you know, water rises to its own, own level. We, we end up with the people that we're like. You know, that's kind of a very Mormon idea, you know, where we, we end up in the three heavens based on how we are and who, who we... We're going to be associating with the people who are just pretty much like us. And to the extent that you're going to just go out and break all this, the, the standards of, of decent society, which, which make it possible for you really, I think, to have the best life, um, I think you're in trouble. And I, I would just say, really, do you really think that's the best way to live? Again, use the golden rule. Um, How about raising your kids without a God? Well, I did it. I did it with, uh, with my daughter, because I left the church in 93. She was born in 90. And um, I don't think it's that much more of a struggle. I mean, if you're, if you're obsessed with... I always felt that as my role of, as a parent was twofold to, to one, keep them from killing themselves or, or another, and, and to, to give them a, a real sense of, of being a, a good citizen and a good um, person in, this, in the society that you live in, that you will be a person of value in this community, that you will contribute and be that person. It, you know, to, 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 to say that you need some big being standing over you saying, you better do this, you better do that, and if not, you're going to burn in hell or whatever you want to do. That's not, you know, there's this idea of goodness for goodness sake. If you want your kids to be good for goodness sake, that's not it. That's being good to get the brownie points to get you where you need to go in the next life. That's not created, creating a true person of value and integrity. That's a person living in fear. And a person living in fear is a person who can be easily manipulated to do great evil far more than a person who is living, learn to live a life of integrity and do what they really believe and what they feel is right. It's, it's just too easy to use those things, to take those things that we've, we've used to manip manipulate people to do, to do what we think is good and twist them around. All of a sudden, they're, they're using them to do something that is, that is terrible to others. And we've seen it throughout history. It's not debatable anymore. We have the data. 
We know how it works. That, that would be my argument to that. All right, I need you to bring Mr. D. I need to talk to him for a little bit. Okay, I can channel him. Let's see. Here we go. All right. Hey. Mr. Deity. Yeah. I must say it's an honor. Does this count as prayer? Uh, well, you know, I don't really answer prayers. So if you want to count it as you prayer, you can. You yeah, I, I do. I have to flush my, my voicemail probably three times a day because they back up billions and billions. And most of them are the same thing. You know, thank you for this. Thank you for that. Oh, and by the way... Could you maybe do this and that and the other for me? I'm a busy guy. I don't have time. Um, oh, I just have a couple questions for you. Yeah. Why the glasses? Well, you know, when I designed my look originally when I came out of the void, uh, I kind of played with it a little at first. Saw Larry. He had these glasses on before, before I did. And I thought, you know what? I don't have the most interesting looking face. I think that would do a lot for my look. I, so it's a little bit of an affectation. If you notice, I don't have any lenses in. Um, I do today because I just wanted to tweak you. But um, generally, I just, I just like the look. You know, it makes me look m much smarter. And I'm very obsessed with, you know, looking smart. Because I'm, I've made some mistakes in the past that weren't too smart. So the so non-corrective. I'm sensitive, yeah. Okay. yeah. Why did we lose a third right off the top in the, in the pre-existence? That always kind of... It seems like we could have done better. I don't get that either. I mean, you got two plans, right? You got two plans. One from, from Je Jess, uh, Jesse. 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 No, Jesus. not uh, Jesus. Thank you. One from Jesus says, let's give the people freedom of choice and everything. And then, and then Lucifer, she's, she's like trying to tell everybody, hey, why don't we just lock it down here and we're good to go? I thought it was clear we should have gone with Lucy's plan, but no, we got to have this big war. Hundreds of, I, I, you cannot imagine the hospital bill for that thing. It was a nightmare. And that's why I said, well, you know what? We got to do this on the ground because this is turning into a mess. And then you had those third in the middle who couldn't make up their minds. And you know, I hate people who can't make up their minds worse than anything. Either be hot or cold or I'll, I'll spew the spew. out of my mouth, which by the way is disgusting because it's, it's very slimy and wet and, uh, and it darkens people. I don't know if you know that. Not my idea, by the way. Um, why the dinosaur bones? Well, um, I mean, we had a choice. We could have gone with the, the, the six-day model or the organic model. We decided in the end to go with the organic model, um, which really messed up the whole script. And parts of the script got left in, left out. Um, it's created a, a nightmare for me ever since. But we just let things roll. And the dinosaurs came about. And um, at a certain point, they just got too big for their own britches. And uh, they were hard to control, wouldn't listen to reason. So I had to take the, uh, the old meteor and let them know who's boss. So we took care of that pretty well, I thought. Right. But it's been a long time. It was a long time coming. They so were the here six for day a model? Six day model, it, it, you know, it, I think it could have worked. But it was so much more effort on my part. You know, this thing, I light the match, let it roll, and it and it goes, and it's and it's pretty great. I mean, we had we had some pretty good science advisors on the on the thing, and they you know they said this is what we're going to get. We've run the we've run these the uh, the uh, what do you call them when they when they run the uh, they figure it out on the computer beforehand oh. how much how, how everything's pretty much going to roll out. I said, this, this is pretty much as good as, as the six-day model. In the end, you get the same results, so let's go with that. Gotcha. I got to play a lot of golf in the meantime, okay. me and Zeus. All right. Who won? Well, he cheats. You know, that's the thing. I have some integrity to me, and he cheats. He, you know what he does most of the time that just annoys the hell out of me, no pun intended? He's constantly, when I'm trying to putt, he takes his putter and lifts up my kilt. <laughs> and, you know, then everyone can see the backside of me, which is how Moses got a peek in, in, the, in the beginning anyway. So it's annoying, and then it gets me angry, and then I miss, you know, I miss the putt. So he, he and I are talking right now because of that whole thing, in fact. All right, here's something I've never understood. We're all making mistakes down here, yeah. yet somehow we're supposed to feel bad about it. Yet you created us, and then somehow someone else has to take the heat to make it so that we can go back... And I'm trying to figure out why we feel bad when we were made this way and then why someone else has to pay the price. 
You know what, that's, that's a good question. I, I don't have a good answer for you. It seems silly. Um, I blame the writers, you know? I said, give me a good script. We need a good story. They said, these people love blood. We gotta throw some of that in there. So you got the whole Jesus thing. Um, I should never have put Mel in charge of that part of the script. That was a disaster. I learned now the guy's a tyrant. He's just a nut. So what did I know though at the time? Uh, if maybe if I'd been recording conversations of his earlier, I could we could have avoided this whole mess. It does seem crazy, I admit it. But you know, what are you going to do? You, you you got underlings. This is what they do, and I can't look over everything. You know, I'm not an I'm not an overseer. I'm j I just kind of I'm the guy with the ideas. You know, I know kind of what I want, but I, I'm not good at follow through. So not my fault. That's what I would say. All right, all right. Why are there so many dang churches? Why couldn't you just kept it simple? Which one's the right one? Well, have you ever played telephone? You know, the thing where I say, I say something to you, you got to say it to them, they got to say it to them, they yeah, got to say it yeah, to them. Yeah. That's basically the problem right there, uh -huh. is nobody can get it straight from what I said originally. It is. Yeah. I mean, it just goes and goes and goes and goes. It would have helped if they'd had some kind of written language earlier. Um, that would have been nice if they could have written these down. Or, or, you know, I put it on the tablets for him, and then what does he do? Chucks them. And uh, he had me write another, another pair, but I don't, I don't remember exactly what I said on the first one. That's why I did the first one originally, so we'd have it written down, and he messed that up. So ever since then, it's a lot of, he said this, he said that, no, I think he said that, no, but does he mean this? Or, and then, you know, so which all one? of a sudden you've got exegesis, so, you know, it's just crazy. So which church is the one? Um, you know, I like the Catholics a lot. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I'm, I'm, at this point, I'm, I'm ready to pick one. But based on the hats right now, I would go with the Catholics. They clearly have the best wardrobe. Um, they're big. It's opulent. It's quite a show. I like show. Uh, if you saw the Big Bang, gorgeous. I had a lot of purples and blues put in, and then it turned into this whole red and green thing. Very Christmassy. Gorgeous. And the Catholics do that pretty much better than anybody else. So I like them. I like the Greek Orthodox, too. They have nice hats. <laughs> What's up with proxy work for the dead? That seems like a lot of work. That couldn't wasn't my just, plan. Could you have just like, you know, you know, if, if, you know, if Jesse can make it right for us, why couldn't you have done some other little thingy? Yeah. And now we're spending a thousand years doing stuff. Or I mean, I imagine people up in heaven, like, accepting. And then you're like, oh, wait a minute. You know, you're looking down. Wait. Yeah. Okay. All right. You can go. Well, now. you know, Peter's the worst at the pearly gates. He he will not let you in if you don't have the right paperwork. In fact, we had a problem with him not letting in the FedEx guy because he didn't have the. And I've, I've told him I don't know how many times. If it's a FedEx guy, any kind of delivery guy, you got to let him in. Get him, give him the two hour pass. He gets to find the office that's supposed to be delivered to. No, he won't do it. In fact, he's chopped a guy's ear off several times. Jesus wasn't around either time to reattach. So the guy walked out with, a, with his ear in a bag of ice. But the whole proxy thing was not my idea. I don't know where that came from. I think people made that one up because it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make any sense to me. Because for me, you know, you're in the afterlife. You would have accepted, you know, the boy. I just say, you know, let him in. Give him, give him a pass. Plus, you know, it's ridiculous having people take all this time out of their lives to go to go do these things. It's just time consuming. You know, I, I'm never for that. I want people to enjoy their life. You know, my, the first question I ask people when they come in is, why didn't you partake of every pleasure that I allowed? Not a lot of people answer that well, let me tell you that. <laughs> why Joseph? Why Joseph Smith? Why Joseph? Well, I mean, you 14 know. 14 years old, farm boy, I'll uneducated. tell you why, because we had a great meeting with him. He comes in, he has a lot of great ideas for the end times. Um, he has this whole thing because we're very, we're very money conscious up there because this is not a proper universe. This is an indie universe. We don't have a lot of funding. He says, you know what? I can get you a lot of guys going out, spreading the word. Good looking kids, white shirt, tie. We're not going to have to pay them a thing. In fact, they're going to pay you to do it. What do you think of that? I said, this is brilliant. I love this kid. Then he comes up with this great idea to do three heavens, only one of which really has to be the opulent thing. And not even a lot of people in that one. The rest, you know, it's kind of like, it's like Nordstrom's and then kind of JCPenney's and then Walmart. <laughs> and I'm thinking these two, 
we don't have to spend anything. <laughs> We're good to go. Let's, I love it. So he got, he got my ear on that one. And then um, he had some other great idea. I didn't find out later that the guy was a little nutty. He had this thing about, about not liking the blacks, not wanting them to have the priesthood. Didn't dig that at all. And then Lucy really got on me because he wanted to have multiple wives, which I, I know that he thinks I thought that was a great idea originally. I did not say anything like that. I thought he, was, I thought he said, when he said multiple wives, multiple lives, I thought he was talking about reincarnation or something. I thought it was a great idea. So we're in the meeting. He tells Lucy what a great idea I think it is. I'm in all kinds of trouble. I haven't talked to him since, I'll tell you. That was Brigham who did the blacks thing. I think Joseph was okay. That's, that's right. His, 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 his Larry. Okay. That's right. That's what I call Brigham. He's, he's, uh, he's <laughs> Joseph Larry. Larry. Yeah. So um, uh, why women always get the raw deal? Well, you know. I mean, blacks, we like, blacks get it before the I'll women. tell you why. You know, when we were running the six-day model, every single time it was the woman who would take from the tree. Every single time. Adam didn't want to have anything to do with it. He would just say, no, not going to do it, not going to do it. We, no matter how, time, how many times Lucy would go down, go down to talk to him, whatever she was dressed in, I don't care how seductive she looked, we could not get Adam to partake of the fruit. But the woman would go for it every time, often because Lucy would promise a shopping spree with shoes involved. So I just thought, you know what? Let's give them hell. I mean, they really do deserve it because if this is what we're going to get from them, if this, if this is their best and, it, and it's a foolproof, you know, that's just the way they're going to be, we got we to gotta give them the, the, the short end because someone's got to get the short end. That's just the way it goes in life. You either have the guys getting the short end or the, the gals getting the short end. Now it's kind of flipped. It started to flip a little, and I'm okay with that now. You know, I wouldn't have given them the right to vote, but, hey, that's you. All right, how about the blacks? The blacks, I don't understand where that came from because I love dark skin. Absolutely love the dark skin. Larry and I lay out all the time. He loves rubbing the cocoa butter on me. I think that's a little weird, quite frankly, but I enjoy a good tan. Job had a great tan. Don't know if you know that because once we took everything out you know, from him, he was pretty much out in the sun all day. So he was always, he was looking great all the time. And that's when I fell in love with that look. I said, this is pretty good stuff. We got to do that. Um, unfortunately, I forgot to tell my people that, you know, the dark skin is good. So the blacks have, like the ladies, have kind of gotten a raw deal. But that was my bad. So I'll, I'll accept that one. Yeah. yeah. And, and the gays too. Gays. That was just a that was just a mistake. I had been talking to Larry. I don't even remember how we got onto the, the conversation. We were talking about homosexuals, and I thought they're great because they have design sense. And, um, you know, they always create great communities, cleanest parts of town, uh, best shopping, really. And then uh, I said something about we got into politics, and I thought that, that America could become an abomination. That's what I said, abomination. And he thought that I said homosexuality was an abomination. Got into the script. Uh, it got to the printers before we could cut it, and uh, it got in there somehow. I don't know how, because they never, they have not paid me a dime, by the way, for my book. I have not seen one cent on the royalties. I don't think it's ever going to happen at this point. We're, I think we're going to have to get the lawyers involved, who I hate, by the way, hate lawyers. They muck up everything, but I think we're going to have to actually do that. And in that, we're going to get that, we're going to see if we can get the abomination thing taken out. All right, all right. And I was right about the abomination, was I not? Yeah, you were. We have a black president. All right, so uh, let's say, you know, world ends, we all come up to live with you. What are we going to do? I don't know. You know, we've been thinking about that because we, we were thinking for a long time, are we going to do an afterlife or not? Because it's, it's, it's expensive to do, first of all. People don't realize there's a lot of cost involved. Um, and then, you, do you, are you going to segregate everybody? Are you going to keep the good guys from the bad guys? Do we really have to do the hell thing? Hell is really expensive. Got to have a lot of workers tormenting people all the time. And then it's bad for their psyches as well. You know, people never realize the, the human cost. Plus the heating, the heating bill. Heating is unbelievable. And then Lucy has to have all of her sections uh, air conditioned. Um, that's another expense. So I'm not sure what we're going to do. I, I think if we could just... Um, 
maybe have a few live for a while at a time and then they go away and then we just keep cycling. You know, because I don't think anyone would really want to live forever. It's going to get boring at some point. You've pretty much done it all. Aren't you bored? I'm kind of bored. Yeah, that's why I shut off my all-knowingness. All-knowingness is awful. I mean, it ruins everything, particularly the, uh, the ending of uh, M. Night Shyamalan movies, even the good one. Um, I think it's Shyamalan. Oh, is it bad to... Shyamalan? It, it's it probably to bad to correct me. <laughs> we'll see. You could, you could end up down there with Lucy now. <laughs> Correcting the deity. Who do you think you are, man? <laughs> Jeez, Louise. Uh, Let's see how long you live. Huh? Watch out for the bus. That's all I'm going to tell you. Okay? <laughs> when you step off a curb every time, you're going to be thinking of me. All right. Thank you, Mr. Deity. You're welcome. <laughs> all right. Well, Brian, we really appreciate uh, you coming on Mormon Stories today. Sure. Had a great time. Yeah, that this has was been fun. fun. Um, let's just end real quick with, uh, you know, if you have any final, I don't want to say your testimony, but uh, if you have any closing thoughts or feelings or convictions or words of wisdom, I know my, my 12-year-old, my 14-year-old daughter is going to be watching this interview. They love your show. Uh, I have something very important for everyone. All right. Go to MrDeity.com. <laughs> And subscribe or donate to MrDD.com to keep it going. And buy the DVD because it's great. We have a lot of extra stuff. Other than that, I just want to tell people, you know, it's everybody has to start thinking of this stuff in a little bit more rational a way. Because uh, aside from the, the, just the danger that can come about by taking this stuff too seriously, which, you know, all I have to say is 9-11, 9-11, 9-11, um, to get that point across. You know, it does, I think it does create very divisive um, things because these ideas, if they're immune from reason, then there's really no way for us to, dis to discuss them rationally and calmly with each other. It, in the end, what it comes down to is we gotta, we gotta fight to see whose God is, is better and whose God is on what's, or whose, whose side God is on. And um, that's another thing that just empirically throughout history just continues to plague us on and on and on. But mostly go to mrdeity.com. And, uh, and subscribe or donate. <laughs> we got to keep this show going. What we're trying to do with this show, what we really want to do is at some point be able to do this in a 30-minute kind of uh, one-camera sitcom thing. There's, right now, there's no one in America who has the guts to do it, apparently, because my managers talk to all of them. They're all scared to death, mainly about the center of the country. So we might have to go elsewhere to Canada or, or Great Britain or... Uh, but if Penn and Teller can Aussie. do something... I know, that's what I thought. Why, why, why Penn and Teller? Why can they do their stuff and, and or Californication? You'd think that would be cause it. But you know what? When it's about God, particularly, uh, it's dangerous. It's dangerous turf. And particularly when you know when when the economy is like it is, they don't want to take chances. No one in Hollywood wants to take chances. And I get it. I get it. So but that's why people need to support this effort that we, we're maintaining. Do you think humor and art is a much more effective delivery vehicle for the for the message, I think for some, I think I think it takes everything. You know, um, and anything where you're where you're trying to make big change happen, you, you got to have Martin, and you got to have Malcolm. You, you you know, one one side isn't going to do it for everybody. Some people need to have someone who's more militant, like a Dawkins or a Hitchens, pound them over the head. Other people can be just kind of gently persuaded, and some can ha you know just laugh their tuchuses off. Uh, to it and then start really thinking about it. So I, there's no one approach I think that works in general and I, I'm going to do my thing. This is what I do well and um, I'm just going to keep doing that and see what happens. So listeners, viewers, MrDeity.com make a healthy, sizable donation. There we go. Take the donation you might have given to this podcast for this month <laughs> and wow. give it to the deity. Wow. Wow. I think you could generate your own money being you a just, deity. You just bought yourself some safety from the bus. Did I, Let me tell did you that I, right there. Yep. Did I fix it? Yeah, you fixed it. That's there we it? go. That's, That's it. I You're set. I atoned. That's all it takes. Oh, we're, we're good. That's why the, the, the collection plate goes around. That's what's important. <laughs> Thank you, Brian Dalton. Thank you.